Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to our last Idaho Soil Health 5 for 5 of the season. Uh, we'll start these up again in December. Um, but this meeting um, is on nutrient management. Um, and we have, I guess, four, yeah, wonderful people here to talk about different aspects. I think, yeah, we'll have a pretty broad range of different topics on nutrient management today. Um, so it should be a pretty exciting meeting. Uh, we have Ryan Striebeck and Kurt Hewer of Hegler Farms, uh, Travis Youngberg, who's with the NRCS, and Jared Cook with Rocky Mountain Agronomics here with us today. So um, I think just, yeah, all this meeting is being recorded and I'll put it on our YouTube page, which um, it should be up next week at some point. And I can put, I'll put that in the chat here just in a minute. Um, and what else? I just wanted to plug our, we have a field day coming up on Thursday um, with Blake Matthews, who is with us actually right here. Um, <clears throat> this is gonna be a pretty cool series of field days over the summertime. So the one on Thursday is gonna be kind of an introductory um, day talking with Blake, discussing who he is, what he's been doing. Um, and then we'll have, yeah, a couple more over the season, like one during planting, one mid season, and then one maybe in harvest harvest uh, time, which is, I mean, we're kind of still planning those, but that's kind of the idea so that we can see the progress all throughout the season. So hopefully some of you can join us for um, one or many of those, because I think it's a really exciting, um, really exciting thing, kind of learning, yeah, we're calling it uh, regenerative ag from A to Z. So should be a pretty comprehensive uh, learning experience for those who are just getting started. Um, but I think with that, I think that's everything that I wanted to share this morning. Um, so if Kurt and Ryan, if you're ready, I think we're good to go for you to share. Courtney, real quick. Yes. Can we, do we want to have them like if there's any questions that I have or anyone else have, do we want to wait until they're done with their slides or do we want to just interject while we're going or what do you want to do there? Thank you for reminding me. I forgot how to, I forgot to say, yeah, how we do this all. Um, so the way that this works, yeah, it's five for five. So that means that our speakers will have five, five-ish minutes. We're not very strict to present five-ish slides or less. Um, and yeah, so we'll have Kurt and Ryan go and then we'll take questions for them afterwards. So if you want to put them, in, you can put them in the chat or if you can, um, yeah, write them down. But we'll take questions after each speaker's presentation is over with. Thanks for that, Kurt. All righty. So just a little introduction. Um, I'm Ryan Stredbeck and I kind of oversee the research and development here at Hegel Creek Farms. And I'm here with Kurt and he's our General Farm Manager. Morning in progress. Stress, stress, stress. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about kind of our how we how we make decisions on how to treat our fields. So there's kind of a there's a four step process that we kind of go through. The first thing is sampling, um, and it just is you know it's so, just so important to know where you're starting. You know, it's, it's kind of like uh, if you just start putting stuff on for the sake of putting stuff on, you know, amending your soil, then it's kind of like starting a book in the middle, right? You're not going to know where you're starting at. Um, then we plan, we implement that plan, and then we measure, did it work? And we come up with conclusions and we figure out if it's another tool we can use in the future or not. So... We do a lot of sampling. Um, that's probably most of what I do actually is um, we take our own in-house biology tests of our fields. I actually, I actually uh, mapped all of our fields biologically, um, categorized them, several different families and how we really, like what we can expect to see there biologically. We take our annual soil tests that we submit to a lab. Uh, we also test our manure water and compost to know what we're putting out there and how much of what we're putting out there. Another thing that we started doing this past year that's kind of newer is 
we look at all of the commercial products we purchase under the microscope and really try to get a feel for what's in there. You know, uh, and we learned a lot from that. Not all biologicals are created equally and they look largely different. Like it's hard to find two that look similar. Uh, and then we do the, the petiole sampling and sap sampling during critical growth stages. Kind of our motto that we've come to really use around here is you can't manage what you don't measure. And it's just so much easier when you can quantify what's going on on your farm to really make decisions. So Ryan wanted me to talk about the planning side of it. So first thing that kind of goes through my thought process is um, some of the obvious things. What kind of crops do we need to grow for the, for the year? Just kind of a simple crop plan, crop rotation, rotation, and starts to get into more of the details of what varieties and day lengths. Um, and I, our farm is split up into different areas where, especially I guess on corn, I, I risk or I weigh the risk of, of frost. Um, we have areas that are more likely to freeze in certain uh, lower parts of our farm versus others. And so um, I decide to do different varieties, um, shorter, shorter day varieties, depending on what crops were in those, whether it was a cover crop, whether it was a trick crop, whether it was corn on corn, um, or if we were following beets that our neighbors rented that year, sometimes it happens. Um, I just have to weigh all those, weigh all those different um, uh, variables. And then after using the samples that Ryan has taken and our soil samples, what we've decided to put down for compost and which fields can get manure water. Um, that's when I start making decisions on what else do we want to put on there um, versus, you know, synthetic and biologically um, minerals, you know, soft rocks and other things that we've, we have ventured into. Um, and then basically build that crop plan. And then it changes about 20 more times through the whole process. So, just push the arrow. Yeah. So then, when we go to implement this, um, a lot of this stuff has been pretty foundational. We've been doing it for quite a while, so a lot of it is um, kind of second nature. But at the same rate, we also continue to do stuff, new stuff. It seems like here, um, this year we're going to be growing some hemp fiber hemp. Um, so I got a couple fields that I think about a lot because they're new. But once again, I, I, when we try to implement this, one of our staples have been no-till. So we try to minimize as much as possible of moving that soil. We have seen huge benefits of water penetration, carbon sequestration. Um, uh, we've... We've seen organic matter. We've just we've mapped all of our soil samples recently, and we've seen an increase in our soil organic matter um, going up. And that's what I always hoped that was going to happen, and we're we're seeing that, which is encouraging and hopeful. Um, we so with the cover crops, um, I do weigh those ones differently because of timing of being able to plant. Usually we can plant a little earlier because that field is, um, it's almost, I treat it more like a field that got tilled, you know, that people typically till in the fall, it's ready to go in the spring. A lot of our fields aren't ready to go so quickly because we have a, a double crop of triticale, but we have implemented cover crops the last several years and we can get into them a little earlier, which is good. And then we're also seeing huge biological boost and uh, carbon uh, organic matter. And we are, I, I'm enjoying the no tilling into these cover crops um, with corn, especially. So then I start to decide, okay, which synthetics can we pull back on? Um, and that's, that's what we're experimenting with is um, trying to spend less, see what the cover crops have given us 
over short-term and long-term benefits. Um, the one more thing that we've been implementing is our um, kind of our mineral solution with the soft rocks and gypsum. Um, this year we are trying, I'd, I'd be curious if anybody's tried this, but I'm, I'm trying it for the first time this year, but we got some beet lime dirt and I'm gonna put it in a compost yard, one compost yard, um, mainly for the calcium. We have high max soils. Our calcium to magnesium ratios are pretty tight. They're not uh, what I want them to be. We're anywhere from two to one would be the high, you know, the, the most narrow to, we do have some that are close to five to one, more like four to one. Most of them are three to one. So we're trying to add some calcium um, cheap as possible. And um, so we're gonna put some beet lime. I may add some elemental sulfur to that uh, possibly, but try to boost our calcium um, percentages when we go to apply our compost. So at the end of all of this, like it would be a real shame if you put in all the effort, you did these trials, you, you know, you found these solutions and then you just never measured if they worked or not. Right. And you never know to what degree did it help or not help. Right. And so this again is where I kind of come into to things and um, it's, it, we track our yields. We have yield mapping. We do some of the precision mapping through John Deere. Um, we do plot trials. I think we have, I don't know how many plot trials. I don't, I think we have four fields that are in corn that aren't in plot trials. So we have more plot trials than not. Um, and we have, I put in here a, a half and half fields. So just, we always have a control. So whatever we do, we do it to half of the field. We compare the yield, we compare what we see um to from the control to the whatever we applied the, the variable side of things um and another thing that is really important is taking the soil samples from year to year and looking at them you know going back in time and seeing trends uh, we went back 20 i guess it was 25 years on organic matter and salts just to see what we did and how it affected those those numbers throughout the years. Um, then you know the the sap samples and petioles, how the plant is reacting to what we're doing, um, and then observational data. Like if you have yellowing in your corn, and you do something to it, and the yellowing goes away, you know that might be a solution, right? Something as simple as that. Uh, and then something that we're going to kind of really implement this this year is the nutrient density of our crops. Because where we grow for feed, if we can grow a crop with the same inputs, but we can make the nutrient density better, then it just is so, so beneficial from a financial point of view. You know, you feed less feed, the cows eat less, they have more time to make milk or to grow beef or what, whatever they need to do. So, and then we also put in here something that we've done in the past is attending the workshops and conventions, just sharing ideas, really networking, networking yeah, hearing what other people are doing and, uh, and thinking, could this work for us? Are we, do we wanna try this? And it's just been so beneficial, all of, uh, all of the places that we've gone and the ideas we've heard. That's that. Nice job, you two. Thanks so much for sharing. It's really impressive all of the trials and data you've collected. Um, you have a ton of information, so I really appreciate you sharing it with us. Um, and yeah, we can take questions for Ryan and Kurt if there are any questions. I wanna know if anybody's heard of this beet lime. Be I know some people have been putting it on, on the ground. Has anyone put it in compost? Has anyone heard of that? Yeah, Kurt, <clears throat> Jared Cook speaking. That we've done that for quite a few years, integrating into compost, uh, field spreading, you name it. Right. Biggest challenge you have with beet lime is that the calcium is in the calcium carbonate and the calcium oxide form, so it's not readily available for utility in the soil. 
So you got to react it. You got to react that calcium carbonate with an acid, blow off the carbonate. So you got ionic calcium. And so that's where a sulfuric acid would be most ideal. Just go make your own gypsum. Would, would elemental sulfur do that through the composting? Like would it eventually get to that point? No, because you'll, you'll lose, if you're going to add the elemental sulfur in the compost, you'll lose your, most of your sulfur is sulfur, uh, sulfur dioxide gas. It'll never make it to the sulfate form to where you can actually react it against the carbonate. And so it'll be a complete loss. I would use the elemental and sulfuric on the field, not so much in the compost. Not in the compost. Yeah. Just gas off. Yeah, it'll gas off. Been there, done that, boss. So, but you put that, com that compost on the ground and then you put that sulfuric down on it like we've done in the past. Would that, mm -hmm. would that help that process? Well, yeah, the, the sulfuric and the elemental combination. I do a combination so you can get a pretty fast bang followed by like the liquid elemental will give you a sustained acid reaction over time. Uh -huh. And so you can have a more beneficial effect on the calcium carbonate. Okay. Yeah. So what are the pHs of your soils? <clears throat> say, say that again. You were pretty quiet. Couldn't hear you. What are the what are the pH of your of your soils typically? We're typically low eight. The highest one I think we got is like eight four, but to typically eight eight one eight two. So typically for our um, uh, southern Idaho soils, there's uh, quite a bit of calcium carbonate in the system, and those numbers around eight two um, are are pretty are pretty typical. Um, and are typically driven by the calcium carbonate. I'm interested in the uh, lime application in the in the compost is kind of a, a cool I idea, and uh, I'd like to maybe hear more about that later. Um, but hey, I had a different question that I wrote down um, when you mentioned it, and you said you have a biological categorization kind of schema for your your fields. Um, and I'm wondering if you could tell me more about that. Is that based on just like my total microbial biomass, so fungi to bacteria ratios, or or what 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 are you uh, doing there? Uh, all of the above. So we have an in-house microscope. Um, uh, as we were, as I began to map our fields, um, I tried to think of every category I could think of that might be beneficial, and then also you know kind of the effort effort versus the benefit, right? Because you can, with biology, you can go way detailed, but you know, if you're spending four or five hours per sample, like it might not be the best use of your time, right? For at least for us. And then that will depend on the operation. But I categorize um, all of our fields by, uh, I can actually probably pull it up and show you. Let me, um, Pull that up and share that. So um, let's see right here. Okay, so these are the spreadsheets that I that I came up with. So this is all of our fields. This is what was in them last year. This is 2023, fall 2023. But I do the crop type, beneficial bacteria observed, pathogens observed beneficial to pathogen ratio, bacteria, total bacteria population, the biomass estimate of that population, beneficial units of fungi, which is a measurement that uh, Dr. Lane Ingram uses, which is a, it's a linear measurement of fungi strands. Then any non-beneficial fungi, that ratio, the fungal units in a spectrum test, which is the bio, what's, what's that test called? The biometer. The biometer, microbiometer. Um, this fungal to bacteria ratio that also comes from that. And I use this as kind of a check of my physical observations that I do under the microscope just to make sure I'm in the right neighborhood. Then protozoa, nematodes, microarthropods. Uh, and then this is a number that I've come up with. Um, <laughs> I kind of invented it but it is out of 100, 100 being ideal biological conditions for field corn, uh, where that field is at. And so it's a, 
it's kind of a complex formula, but it just weights these different categories to a certain degree. Um, and I can't see what that, oh, then the yield rating, but that's a whole other thing. So that's, that's how we do our physical biological scoring system. Um, and it's just, a, mostly it's physical counts. What I saw under certain dilutions calculated into per gram of soil. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. That represents a lot of work. Yeah. Um, I'm familiar. I'm familiar with Elaine Ingham's um, process and you know identification courses and stuff. That's a that's you put a lot into that. That is super impressive. <laughs> well, I'm thank you. Sure you half cross-eyed by the time that was uh, by the time you get through a bunch of that um, with the scope, but. Uh, Super cool stuff. Do you do you think is there um, some correlation between your numbers and your and your um, and your soil types or your your management that that really popped out as you got into that? So certainly um, some management. I actually have a graph that shows um, that cover crop um, cover cropping scores much much higher on. Well, everything has a bioscore, right? So in the end, after I gathered all that data, I graphed it by crop type. And it was astonishing to see how beets that were conventionally tilled and harvested had an average bioscore of around 28. Um, and then cover crops had an average bioscore of 89 out of 100. Um, corn was right around the high 60s. Uh, alfalfa was just below that and triticale was just below that. And so it was- We also have sod. Oh, and well, the sod actually scored the lowest. It was, uh, I think I had an average score of about 18 out of 100. So definitely management practices. Also, it was, it was interesting at least to talk with Kurt where I didn't necessarily know the management practices that were going on, but I would say, I noticed this in this field and Kurt would say, well, we did this and this. I'm like, oh, that might explain it. And definitely for sure, you, there is a clear and direct correlation between management practices and the effects on biology. Almost always, but not, there is those outliers. Like we do have several fields that were like, it's a sod field and mm -hmm. it's still doing really good. We're like, man, we, you know, there's still those, there is outliers, but generally it is, I guess I was a little surprised to see such a correlation. I'm like, wow, there is a direct, and I was thinking it would be like a, long-term three four five year to really see these effects but biology and nature is just it's so vigilant right and these cover crops one one year like we planted these in july by that fall when we were sampling them in what late september october mm -hmm. huge amounts of of activity just like wow like it it, it really if you do if you if you feed those those environments we saw huge responses but yeah. same in the other direction i think you know it's hard to have fungal life and fungal growth when you're moving the soil every spring and every fall or during harvest and it it that's it just it makes sense so yeah yeah you guys get a rock star award for the data data collection and observation that's um it's <laughs> awesome and even though it lends credence i think we've been we've been preaching things like um conservation crop rotation and uh um uh, covered crops and low till no till uh for years and then um you know you're what what you're observing is is backing all of that up and so I guess the last thing I would say is if you're not taking advantage of uh, NRCS uh, uh, programs, uh, you, you might consider it. There's a, a, a lot out there uh, in terms of available cost share for those practices. So. Yeah, we just started that this year. I was pretty reluctant to do it. I don't, I'm not much of a handout guy, but I finally decided this year, you know what? I'll take advantage of some of those opportunities where we're doing it. Said so we'll put it to good use. So we are this year. All right, I'm glad. Um, and I think we have a question in the chat too that you mostly answered that first question, um, but it also asks: Are you seeing less 
weed disease and insect pressure with more fungi. I, so the weed one is hard. I would say initially, yes, I do see less weed pressure, but when it comes to spraying where we do double crop, I have to spray, I have to spray things out. I have to spray a cover crop out if I got regrowth coming from it, or I got to spray out my triticale in the spring because it's regrowth. Once we harvested it, it just shoots back up. And so, yes, I see less weed pressure, but I'm not spraying less because I have other things because I didn't conventionally till it. That That is basically kind of a spray pass, right? You disturb everything and set all the weed seedlings and weed things back. We're not doing that. So yes and no. Disease, um, I don't, I don't know. I don't think so. I haven't, the one thing that I, I'm trying to, we don't have a lot of disease pressure. Aphids, not usually a problem, but spider mites is our biggest problem. And I have some ideas. Brad McIntyre told me this year to just try to give it a big carbon load um, before that, before that comes and trying to get the chlorides out of the plant. But that's, that's my biggest issue when it comes to the season pests and insects is, is the, the spider mites in our corn, but typically everything else, our cover crops, our trit, um, it's, we, we usually don't treat for anything. It's, yeah, it's typically like the triticale. I never treat for anything on that. We usually plant it. And if I have manure water for it, I don't even give it any fertilizer. Um, triticale loves manure water and those ones yield better than the ones that I give synthetic fertilizer to, but my whole farm can't get manure water. So that's the challenge, I guess, with that. But, but yes, we are seeing more fungi, which is typical, like is kind of the traditional lack, I think, of the two of bacteria and fungi is I think fungi takes the biggest hit when it comes to tillage and our conventional practices. So we are seeing, you know, we're literally seeing mushrooms in our field, you know, um, and more hyphae and spores. So it's hopeful we're, we, you know, we want to be about to that one to one ratio, maybe a little more for our vegetables that we typically grow. Um, some fields are there and some are very far away. Constant work in progress. Yeah. Uh, are there any other questions for Kurt and Ryan? All right. Well, thank you so much, you two. It was really um, fun to hear you talk about all of the cool things you're doing. You're welcome. All right, Travis, I have you up next. Are you ready to go? Sure, about as ready as I'll ever be. <laughs> Perfect. Sorry. All right, the floor is yours. All right, we'll see if I can share my screen. I don't have a lot to share on my screen, but a little bit here. You can get it. Oops. Let me know if you can see it. Oh, come on. Yeah, it's looking good. Okay. So I was asked to talk a little bit about uh, uh, the chemical part of soil health and the nutrient management side of things. You know, this is the side that we probably have the most uh, data on and the most we put the most research into over the years and have the biggest understanding of but, you know, biological, not so much, you know, and maybe some of the physical stuff, but there's such an inner uh, connection between <clears throat> all three, you know, you can't, there's sometimes things like even in the physical soil structure that are affected by chemical, you know, uh, adjustments in the, in the field. And, you know, one of the things that uh, I wanted to talk about, you know, this, I like this, uh, this is really the only slide I'm going to put up here, but um, I want to talk about a few other things here. Um, this uh, little three circle picture comes from the soil health assessment that Cornell puts together. Um, and it basically breaks it out into the three things that when you stop and, you know, I used to talk to kids about soil health, you know, we do those uh, field days with kids and trying to explain what good soil uh, health looks like and what makes a good soil um, for crop production. And, and 
it kind of breaks down, you know, Cornell kind of breaks it into these three different categories. But I want to talk a little bit about the chemical side of things when it comes to the soil health realm, because there's a lot of things, you know, we've found with NRCS over time that, you know, if you neglect any of these three parts of the system, you know, whether it be physical, biological, or chemical, uh, you can get undesirable results and things kind of get out of balance. You know, that's one thing that uh, if anything that I've learned over the years of doing nutrient management with folks is, is that things need to be in a balance. They weren't really meant to be, you know, really lopsided one way or the other. Uh, they're meant to be kind of in a balance. And uh, I remember back to my uh, uh, soil plant nutrition classes at college, you know, I remember I'm talking about Liebig's law and how it's the law of the minimum, right? And it's the thing that's the most limiting that's gonna basically set your yield uh, to where you can't, it's gonna limit yield in some way or another and the productivity of that plant. Well, I think that there's more than just, that applies more than just to the nutrient load. <laughs> um, any kind of part of this system, when you're talking about a soil health management system, you can't neglect any piece or part. And, and I, I think sometimes, and even we as NRCS sometimes focus so much on maybe the physical and biological that we we tend to sometimes forget that chemical is still part of the equation. Um, I've heard a lot of folks talking about, oh gosh, you know, uh, they show graphs of different effects of nutrients in the soil, and they show that over time, you know, we as a nation have you know put on more and more fertilizer and getting less and less yield and etc and then they start attributing it to well the more fertilizer uh it doesn't equal the, uh, more yield and and therefore you know we're also they try and make the connection that oh we're we're making it so that the soils are less productive um just for applying fertilizer but my experience has been that it's not the application of fertilizer, it's the over application of fertilizer that is the problem. You know, plant nutrients uh, themselves are needed for plant growth. And uh, because we're harvesting stuff off the field over and over year after year, and we're taking something off, something's got to put that back, you know. Uh, and so that's why over the years we've had these conventional fertilizer programs where we tend to put on different conventional fertilizers to try and replace what we've taken off. The problem is we haven't always done the best job at paying attention to how much is needed. And so soil testing and paying attention to what you have and looking for those places where your most limiting factor is to try and make the most impact. Um, some of the things I think we neglect, and I've seen this, uh, you know, we, we experienced this some in different parts of the state. Um, soil pH has been one. Uh, when you start talking microbiology and stuff, we all know that the, the biology of the soil is greatly affected by the soil's pH. You know, the higher the pH or the lower the pH, you know, you start to affect things in a different way. And so plants like to have it in that, you know, six and a half to seven and a half range, right? Depending on what plant you're trying to grow. Um, but some of the organisms that live in that and work in that environment also need an optimum pH to be able to do what they need to do. Certain nutrients are available in that. Uh, I learned some things. Uh, it was at the National No-Till Conference last year. Uh, somebody brought up, and we've seen this in in uh, here in Idaho and North Idaho, but soil stratification of pH, where we start to apply, uh, you know, some of our soil or fertilizers when, you know, up in the Palouse, we've gone to a lot of no-till systems, which are great, you know, because we minimize soil disturbance, but we've also started to see that we're starting to stratify soil pH because the fertilizers are being placed in the same place year after year after year. They're not getting mixed up. They tend to acidify that soil over time, especially in the seed zone. Um, and when I was at the National No-Till Conference, they talked about stratification of our nutrient placement, where you know if you're not mixing it up or you're not uh, you know paying attention to getting it down in the soil, some of the stuff they were seeing that a lot of this uh, phosphorus and potassium when we just top dress all the time tends to stay in that top inch of the soil and it never gets any deeper than that. 
But if you take a full one foot soil sample, you're taking that whole foot and then you're diluting that one inch's worth of phosphorus in with the rest of it. And you, and you get a reading that says, oh, it looks good. But some of these guys were actually seeing crop deficiencies on crops that they took a soil sample and it was showing it was good, but they were diluting it with that full one foot sample. And when they started to stratify and actually take some individual samples, they could see that, oh, wow. Yeah, we had a really good concentration at the surface where we're applying all of our fertilizer. And so they've changed the way that they view and the way that they apply some of their nutrients because it's placement as well as, um, uh, you know, no till's great, but they weren't getting this the nutrients down into the soil where the plants could get to them. Um, so there's a lot of different things to keep in mind. Um, you have also salinity, you know, salt, uh, sodicity. Uh, you get a lot of, I see a lot of folks uh, throwing things at, at problems sometimes without fully understanding what they're throwing at it, right? And, you know, Sean and I have talked a lot of times too about, you know, I see a lot of guys throwing out gypsum uh, and we had a practice standard. We haven't adopted it here in Idaho. It's used in other parts of the country, but we haven't adopted it because I've seen a lot of guys just throwing uh, gypsum out there to try and uh, increase in water infiltration, for example. But in reality, most of the time, sodic soils, that's why we put on the gypsum is to try and counteract some of the sodic soils and the properties that affect water infiltration when you have a sodic condition, right? But but we tend to take some of those things, you know, some of in the valley where I'm at, we used to have some so sodic soils. And so for years, the rule of thumb was, yeah, let's just put it on because it needs it, right, to increase water infiltration. Well, it's because we had a lot of sodic spots out there. And so it did in those cases. But I see guys now where their soils are back to, uh, to normal and they're still applying the gypsum because they think they're getting a benefit to infiltration. Um, Bottom line, you know, when it comes to fertility, there's there's lots of different uh, ways of sampling. Um, we do have NRCS now has kind of separated. We've, we've always had our nutrient management practice or 590 practice where we help people with nutrient management. NRCS has started to offer some soil health testing uh, and also separated our soil testing from the actual 590 practice. And we have these things called SEMAs, they're conservation evaluation and monitoring activities, trying to open the door to us being able to better monitor not only, you know, what's in the soil so we can make good management decisions, but also to see the effects of some of our conservation practices and what they're doing after we implement them. And I like what I saw earlier, you know, some of the stuff you guys are doing with the biology. I mean, that's kind of where we're trying to head. We're trying to get to where we're using the tools that we have, um, using some of the testing that's available to help us better manage some of the physical, biological, and chemical parts of the soil so we get the optimum uh, out of it. Um, anyway, I just, so those are some of the things that we're doing, our, our, uh, our uh, conservation evaluation monitoring. Uh, we have a soil health test, which actually, you could do several different batteries of tests within that SEMA. Um, it, it actually uh, lets you do some different tests for different parts of the biology. We have a basic soil health suite. We have a couple other individual uh, tests that you can do using that same thing. Uh, and, um, and if you're interested in some of that, I can, I can uh, post a, a link to uh, maybe the uh, standard in the chat so that you can all uh, get to it. But anyway, that's just kind of broad overview. I, I wasn't planning on taking a lot of time today. I, I just have seen over time, you know, with the big push for, for soil health, you know, that we've done over the last several years from NRCS, one thing I, I see people sometimes throwing out some of the conventional wisdom <laughs> just because it is that, you know, conventional wisdom. But we we got to remember that some of these things all fit together. They work together. Um, we've done some things with some of these different, uh, as I've done nutrient management budgets with people, I've seen some folks selling products out there that are, they're 
some of them are good and some of them have benefits, but sometimes the benefits are overstated as far as nutrients go and nutrient availability. Um, and so I've been a little bit cautious in helping people as they transition to a soil health management system and they think they can just completely uh, devoid themselves from the need for fertilizer. Uh, it's not always a good idea. I've seen some pretty big yield losses because people jumped a little too soon and didn't really figure out, you know, we're all about trying to figure out exactly how much you need. I still think there's a lot of folks out there recommending a lot more than is needed. Um, and and I, But I've had a lot of good luck with uh, using our land grant university publications. I know there's a lot of folks that are like, yeah, they're outdated, which I agree. There's parts that need updated to some of the latest soil testing methods and things, but uh, all in all, I've seen good results. The The crops do well when we get things in a good balance. Um, anyway, I think that's all I really had. You guys had some questions. Yeah, thank you, Travis. It's nice to have a reminder of some of the chemical properties and hear about the offerings from NRCS. Uh, yeah, and we can take questions for Travis. Uh, just a, a comment. Um, Travis mentioned something that's pretty interesting um, about no-till and pH stratification and 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 sampling. Um, and rather than developing a composite sample from the uh, the first foot that. Um, in no-till systems, uh, going uh, the first the first six inches, or even even zero to three and three to twelve, or something of that nature, may be more revealing in terms of the true pH scenario in your upper part, um, and which leads to mentions of <clears throat> lime. Um, Travis and I saw some reports from Amalgamated Sugar on the quality of the lime. And Travis, was that just from the Nissa pile or was that, did you also see something from the pile at Paul also? Um, no, I haven't seen the ones from over that direction yet. Um, I worked with Amalgamated a little bit and they gave me some analyses on both Nampa and Nissa. But they told me that, that uh, the Eastern Idaho sites were probably similar to the Nissa plant. Yeah, that was, um, that was that was my understanding is that Paul site was going to be a uh, really high um, calcium carbonate equivalent like uh, like likenesses. So, I mean, a really yeah. uh, fantastic, uh, great, great source. Um, yeah. Both of those you know, areas. one thing I have noticed with those different liming sources, and I've been working with some of the producers up in northern Idaho because some of their soil pHs are getting down in the neighborhoods below 5.2. You know, probably 70% of the Palouse now has dropped below 5.2 soil pH. So there's some issues with that. We've been looking for lime sources, and that's one of the reasons we were working with Amalgamated some. Also, Amalgamated has a large source of lime that they need to get rid of too. So it's a kind of a win-win on the conservation side of things. But, um, you know, the stuff I saw... And the experience that we had and talking to some of the folks up north that have been putting it on. One thing I've noticed is some people tended to think that a ton of uh, sugar beet lime is equivalent to a ton of pure lime. You know, that is not the case. Every lime product has a different lime score and it's a, a, a amount of calcium carbonate equivalent in that product. So the stuff from Nissa was basically, if I if I'm remembering right, it was somewhere in the neighborhood of sixty percent of it was actually calcium carbonate. I was, versus, I was thinking that report I saw said sixty said sixty five percent, which seemed like pretty pretty darn good. And that, the Nampa one is the there's I forget what there's some soil constituents in that right. It's more of a yeah. They're of, using some of their rinse water and they're dumping it in, and it's got some dirt in it. So it tends to dilute it down. And, and that uh, product at the Nampa plant was actually only a lime score of 30%, right? So you're only getting 30% of that ton is, is actual calcium carbonate. So you have to pay attention to, you know, what's the lime score of the product you're applying to really get the same result. It's still calcium carbonate, right? It's still lime. 
Uh, but also, again, I would always pay attention to what am I putting it on for, right? What's the problem I'm trying to solve? Uh, lime is typically put on there to try and raise soil pH. So if you have a high soil pH, it's probably not the thing you want to be putting on, just like well, you know so somebody who had a high pH. Here's the interesting thing about Southern Idaho soils. A lot of them are in that pH of around eight because they've got carbonates in the system. But if you're going no-till and you're getting into that stratified pH scenario, it's possible that your upper part could have a, a lower pH. And if you want to keep it no-till and not mix that and you wanted to, to adjust it, um, that would be an option to do it and to do it with calcium carbonate. And if the pH in your upper part is not in that eight two, what if it's at like six? What if it's at five and a half? Um, that that pH is going to draw the uh, carbonates into, into solution. So because equilibrium in solution with calcium carbonate should be about eight two. So um, if you've got low pH in your upper part and you're adding calcium carbonate to it, um, and it's not in the form of like a rock. Um, it's, um, and most of that, the stuff in the lime piles is passing a, I forget what a 60 screen or something. It's small and it, and it will, yeah. it will work. Um, yep. So. That stuff's like flour, you know, it's really fine, <laughs> finely ground. Yeah. Um, so yeah, coarseness makes a big deal. You know, that's the other thing to remember. I see a lot of guys using rock phosphate out there, like the actual rock phosphate and gosh all this stuff and the research i've seen on it it it's not as readily available it takes a long long time to decompose and release okay. um so i'm also a little skeptical at times about rock phosphate because of that very thing same thing with the lime right if it's in a rock form and it's more coarse it's a little longer to break down and release and be available That's that's all I, I had for you, Travis. The the business of of, of liming and the um, sampling for uh, an accurate pH and no-till systems, I think, is a huge huge point. So, one thing I would also add about you know adding different products to the soil when you add just you know natural products, sometimes you get whatever's in that right. And so, like with the liming, uh, for example, there's actually some good stuff in it too. You have some additional phosphorus and other things. So if you're adding that to your field and you want to account for that phosphorus in your overall budget. Uh, same thing when I'm doing animal waste systems and we're applying com compost and manure, it's really hard to get because it has differing amounts of NP and K and plus your crop, different crops have different needs for amounts. And so if you go out there and you apply to the nitrogen need of the crop, you're going to oversupply the phosphorus by a lot and you're going to really over apply the potassium by even a whole lot more, right? And so it, you, you get what comes with the materials. So like I said before, you want to keep things in a good balance. The idea is to try and get things to their optimum levels. And then uh, it sustains not only plant production, but also biological uh, function as well. Thanks for those reminders, Travis. Are there any other questions for Travis? All right. Well, thank you so much, Travis, for that information. Yep. Um, if you want to stop sharing. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. And Jared, if you're just about ready. Um, yeah, Jared Cook, last but not least, whenever you're ready. All right. Last but not least. I'll keep this separate because I know lunchtime's approaching on us pretty quick. So um, everybody, it's it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, I represent Rocky Mountain Agronomics, which is a fertilizer retailer in uh, Burley. Uh, we have facilities in Blackfoot, Nevada. Anyway, that, that's beside the point. But um, I want to share today a few things that I've seen. I've, I've been in the crop consulting business 16 years now, and I, I wanted to share a few things that I just – don't see many people even considering in the agronomy game when it comes to nutrient management and decision making. And so what I want to show you right now is irrigation water. You know, if, if you guys are to look at your irrigation water as a fertilizer, 
what I've highlighted for you on the right side of my screen is the pounds of actual minerals that two acre feet of irrigation water can provide you in a given year. Now, interesting enough, uh, there, there may be a few dry land operators on, on this call with us today. I would encourage you to do something. I'd encourage you to capture your rainwater and then send it in to Stugenholz or whatever lab you're comfortable with, send it in for a nutritional analysis. See what that rainwater is contributing to your overall soil. So in the case of this system, this is a Southern Idaho test. Um, in the given year, you know, we got two acre feet of irrigation water hitting the ground. Um, let me move this real fast. So you line up, line up the nutrient, the mineral profile, you got 1100 pounds of bicarbonate. That's our number one antagonist in Southern Idaho. It, bicarbonate is a negative charge, has the potential to tie up all of your cations any positively charged element bicarbonate is going to react with. And so bicarbonate in general is our number one antagonist. Two acre feet of water also gives us about 2,500 pounds of total soluble salt. That's not a bad connotation. That's just a, an accumulation of potassium, sodium, magnesium, uh, calcium. Um, but this is what I want, want you to look at pretty closely. Hang on here. Uh, look at the amount of chlorides. 338 pounds of chlorides coming from our water. Sulfate, 420 pounds. Calcium, 222 pounds. You guys see you guys see the laundry list. The other wild card, sodium, 294 pounds. So there's a lot of minerals that are going to hit your farm fields this year. About the time you hit July 15th, you're going to be about half of the year's water applied by July 15th. So half of this mineral application is going to be on your farm. Are you adequate, adequately managing for this mineral concentration? If you're not, I'm going to give you a few strategies right now that will help you dial in how to manage this properly. And so in terms of two acre feet of irrigation water, just for perspective, that's roughly 5 million pounds of water. So in that 5 million pounds, we have all the, that mineral content. If you bump up to three acre feet, that's 8 million pounds of irrigation water hitting your farm, which you know what happens to those mineral numbers. They increase pretty substantially. And so uh, water has the make it or break it potential. And if we're not properly managing it and evaluating our water, we're missing a big, big opportunity to improve our overall nutritional management. And so I like to sample irrigation water on the farms I consult for in the spring, in the summer, and in the fall. And I'll do that repeatedly because as, as snowpack and winter moisture, winter precip levels hit, our water quality judge, does change um, to a degree from year to year. And so I think that needs to be a big part of what, what we're looking at in terms of nutritional management. Now, if you look at uh, a typical Stugenholt soil test. I, I really I like that test. It's a good test. But oftentimes that test is a reflection of total content in your soil. It doesn't necessarily show you a water soluble rating. What, what can the plant get at? And so if you look at Stugenholt's test, particularly on the cations, calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium, that's that's a measurement of those elements locked up on your CEC site. So that's not, they're not always readily available. And so the, the way I, I look at this in terms of how to manage what your water is contributing to your overall soil, we need to introduce a soil testing method called saturation paste. Saturation paste takes one part soil and five parts water. And the cool part of this test is I, I'll, I'll provide our own irrigation water with this testing method. And so we can we can start to see what kind of influence the water has on the available soil nutrients. And so if you look right up here, th this new age, this new age labs, they're measuring water soluble nutrients. So what the plant can access today, that's, that's what it's measuring. It's measuring the amount of nutrition that's ready for uptake. And so if you look at it, you see my little cursor. I don't know if you guys see that where I'm kind of highlighting with my cursor. That's That would be a reflection of a Stugenholz test or ammonium acetate, Olson P type of soil test, um, which is total content. What we're looking at here is nutrient in the soil solution with this new age test. What, what is off the CEC site 
in floating position ready for plant root uptake. And so let me compare this for you real quick. In terms of chlorides, this I look at this in terms of the relationship between chloride, sulfur, and phosphate. They're all negatively charged elements, and so they compete for uptake. The plant doesn't always differentiate phosphorus from sulfur from chloride. It, it differentiates the charge. It differentiates the neg negative charge. And so in this case, chloride is our dominant anion. And so which, which anion is most likely to be taken up? It's chloride. So you get into July, if you're a potato farmer, you get into July, and all of a sudden your, your petiole phosphorus numbers start to tank. Guys, I wonder why. It's typically because we have a massive accumulation of chloride into our system. Because it's, there's, there's inter-anion competition. The same is true for the cations. Look, look at this scenario. This, this rapid soil, so these soil tests, by, by, mind you, are taken at the same exact time. So I can see what the total content is versus what the soluble value is. What this test tells me is that calciums are dominant cation, followed by potassium by five parts per million, and then sodium. Sodium is a formidable opponent to potassium in this situation. There's only a five part per million spread. That's not enough to, to keep potassium as the dominant anion over sodium, if that makes sense. I hope that makes sense. If there's any questions on it, just holler at me. But what this soluble test is telling us is that potassium could be easily beaten up by sodium. Magnesium doesn't have a fighting chance because it's the lowest in relative abundance. And so if we're going to go manage this crop, this potato crop, if we're going to manage this, I have to manage to a degree that allows my potassium and calcium to be dominant. But right now, I'm already starting the season. I'm already at a disadvantage. And so if I don't take into account the relationship of these soluble anions and cations, I'm going to get tuned up on my nutritional management mid-season because I'm going to have massive amounts of imbalance in the plant. And so water quality, What? well, let me rephrase this. What the water is, the soil will become. And so if you're not considering the water, first and foremost, and then if you're not considering the soluble side of that, because think about it, the nutrients in the irrigation water, they're soluble. They're in an available form most of the time. Sometimes they're locked up as a calcium carbonate or bicarbonate form, but there's a lot of solubility in those water, irrigation water minerals. And so the, the best way, and to be honest, the only way I've found to be able to effectively manage what your water is contributing is by looking at a soluble paste extraction. And so um, the idea is like, say, you take those and look at what's what's intermediate between what's on the CEC site and what's ready for plant uptake, we can really refine and hone in on our nutritional management decision making. And so in this case, I'm not going to worry about a calcium amendment. I'm going to worry about a potassium amendment, maybe a magnesium amendment, because um, they're going to get beat up by sodium. Sodium is the smallest molecule. It's super soluble. It's super mobile. And it it has the potential to beat up on those other cations. So I gotta I gotta gear my management to number one, bind up the sodium percentage that's there, that 150 parts per million. I want to bind it up with chemical inputs. I also want to try to bind up the amount of chloride, soluble chloride that's in there. And so this this method has really helped us in the last decade dial in how to manage for optimum nutrition. When, when every pound of the ground counts, when, when you yield is the number one driver of, of farm sustainability, we've got to be able to manage the, the nutritional antagonism that we face, not only because of our indigenous soil, but also because of what the water quality is going to contribute. So I want to wrap it up right there. If there's any questions, I'd like to hear, I'd like to see what the questions are and, and maybe go from that angle, because I'm assuming this saturation paste testing might be a little bit of a new concept to, to most on this call. Thanks so much, Jared. That's a mini chemistry class right here. Um, fun to hear about. And yeah, a very important consideration, uh, what's in your water. So yeah, anybody who has questions, actually, I could start us off. There's one question in the chat. 
Um, okay, do you sample the water source or each pump? For example, if all the water comes from a river or canal, can you just sample once on the canal? I sample at the site. Well, right out of the pivot is where I sample. Um, primarily because you don't know if there's some systems. I mean, some areas you've got tail water draining back into the system. Um, I just, I just want to be so specific. I just go right to the site. And so if you've got a common, common site, yeah, you could sample the source, but I like to go right out of the pivot. That way I know it's accurate. What are you doing to manage these things, Jared? Are you moving more towards foliars to feed the plant what it needs, or what are you putting in the soil to manage these cations? Brad, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked that. So the next step to this would be the integration of sap sampling. Because if you're running a sap sample, sap sampling and running the saturation paste soil testing, there's a direct calibration between the soil test and the plant sap test. And so to manage it properly, Brad, we'll, we'll run the sap analysis, and then that's going to tell us how dominant these, these anions and cations are coming into the plant. Once we can validate if we got chloride dominance or we have sodium dominance, then we know that we can go to foliar applications or fertigation applications through the pivot to help off, offset and, and bind up that antagonism. And so maybe maybe one plug that Thursday, Courtney mentioned early on Thursday, there will be a field day with, with Mr. Blake Matthews. Um, we will go into more detail at that meeting about how we manage this, Brad. So a little plug for that meeting. But anyway, yeah, I, I don't know if that answers that, Brad, or not, but that's that's kind of, that's the strategy I take. Rather than just throwing products at, at this, we'll use testing for validation. My, my models measure three times cut once. And so we'll, we'll do a number of different tests to, to validate what the antagonism actually is. That's kind of why I asked that question. You went right where I wanted you to. My man. <laughs> so Jared, what, what do you think about your EC value at the top of that column of numbers in the middle of the screen? It's that EC is picking up, right? I mean, a target of two EC is where I want to be, but for all intents and purposes, this is a four. So full disclosure, this is after a massive manure application. Um, a local nearby dairy used this field as a dumping ground for uh, the wet waste slurry off of the off the dairy. And so the grower is super worried yeah. that he's, he's going to have a sodium problem. And so we, we yeah. deployed this testing method. So... Well, I don't know if it's sodium, if his problem is going to be sodium specific, but he definitely has a lot of salts. And that EC is um, a one-to-one -one, um, saturated paste extract. Um, also, you mentioned this other that they're doing is a um, five, to five. Five, to one, five times the amount of water as material. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, that EC is another saturated paste extract um, derived um value that's at four and above, I think most agronomic uh, crops are taking a pretty significant yield hit. Yeah. Yeah, for sure, Sean. Yeah, very good point. Hey, Jared, this is Travis. Yes, sir. Hey, I had a, a question for you. You know, one of the reasons that uh, a lot of different tests, you know, I've seen a lot of different tests that U of I has looked at over the years, um, different testing methods. Some of the struggles we've had is because of our high lime content in the soil, it affects some of the reagents and things. And that's why they use the harsh chemical tests, right? They use those extractants like that knock everything off, right? Like you explained earlier. And then they really, with the with the land grant recommendations, they're just trying to, okay, if you have this concentration, we know it's not all plant available, but if you have this concentration in the soil, we're going to get this result for yield if we put on this much fertilizer. And it's kind of more of an index, um, but you're talking about more specifically measuring the actually what's in the solution. Um, 
some of these tests that have struggled here in Idaho have been because of our high lime content soil. That's why they use those harsh reagents to get repeatability, right? So that you get the same result every time. Uh, and so they have these certification programs too. And I know NRCS, uh, we, we lean on those certification programs pretty heavily. Uh, do you guys uh, have any kind of accreditation or certification program that you're part of with the lab? Um, and is it repeatable, like that type of a test? So this, I don't know about the accreditation. I'll have to find out for you on that, Travis. But we, this, this soil testing method, I've been running in my management for 13 years, just saturation paste. Um, so it's, and, and the reason I like it is because it calibrates to plant sap analysis. I've never seen another testing soil testing method that calibrates to any sort of plant test method. And so for my management and trying to drive a farmer return on investment, I like this system because it's a calibration between what's soluble in the soil and what's being taken up by the plant with the sap analysis. And so, but yeah, I, I totally understand where you're at. I mean, I run Haney, the Haney test for years I believe that as good as that is for an index, I believe it overestimates the amount of soluble nutrient in our soil solution because you're using, you're using weak acids, but a high concentration of weak acids, you know, you're, they're running malic acid, oxalic, I think idaconic acid is one of them. They tend to kick more off your CEC site than what any other circumstance can make available. Yeah, I've seen those same things. That's why I was asking the question because I've seen a lot of different tests over the years. I was just curious as to how how you're utilizing it. But uh, right. that's interesting that the correlation between the SAP analysis is so tightly. So are you yeah. seeing that they're coming out, meaning you see the result of I how it show this much, and so the plant's showing it's taken that, and if I bump it, I see the response, plant response? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Because this test, the way I look at this test and interpret it, it's based on relative abundance. Whatever your dominant anion is and whichever your dominant cation is are going to be the dominant anions and cations inside the plant. And so we've got to be able to account for that. And so this this is not a one-time test method. I'll, I'll pull this same soil testing method, this rapid soil test from New Age. I'll pull it five times throughout the season because as summer goes on, as temperature increases, water sh shortages happen, that changes the fluid dynamics of all of these minerals in our system. And so we've got to be able to account for that interactive management. So are you doing the paste together every time? Sorry, I, I couldn't understand that, Brad. Are you are you taking a paste, to, paste and a SAP analysis together every time? Uh, S S Brad SAP weekly, but uh, S rapid soil bi weekly. Okay. Yep. Yep. So I know a lot of guys are going to say they don't have time to do this. How do you get around that? I just grind. The only thing I know in life is how to grind. So <laughs> I just I get it done. Dad, Daddy taught me how to be a grinder. So that's what I do. <laughs> yep. Um, you know what? Let me point out one thing that I think is really interesting. If you look at this, 48 parts per million, if you times that by two, that's the amount of pounds, that's pounds of available phosphate. So, you know, 100 pounds, let's call it 100 pounds of available phosphate sitting there. Look at this, look at this situation right here. Look at zinc, less than 0.5 parts per million. What do you think the problem might be with this particular field about the end of June? There's no phosphate getting in that plant because there's no zinc to support the uptake of the phosphate. On a soluble basis, there's no soluble zinc. If you look back over on Stugenholz's number, I mean, there's, I think, what is it? Uh, I have to move my screen here real quick. Uh, I can't see. I think there's, a, I think there is three parts per million of zinc in Stugenholz's number. But saturation paste says there's none available. So guess what? We better be addressing our zinc issue. And so that's that's the true value of looking at the soluble side of nutrition. Anyway, I just want to point that out. One one comment to add to that, Jared, too, is, I mean, in the past, you know, because this isn't my field, but we, we've been running this method with Jared for, like he said, 13 years now. And, and what we would run into in the past 
is you would run out of phosphate in the plant. And so we, you would think that, oh, hey, we, we need more pee. We need more pee when it actually was a zinc issue. And that's, that's one thing that we found with this is that our, our deficiencies weren't necessarily a deficiency in that element. It was an antagonism from a lack of a different element that was not measurable using the standardized tests um, that, that everybody is using in the past. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, well said, Blake. Isn't that the same with moly and nitrates? Pretty much. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you think about all of the nitrogen assimilation uh, elements, copper, iron, moly, cobalt even, zinc. Dude, they're very low. Iron's a little higher, but all the rest of them are super, super low in solubility. And so I would, I, something, Kurt, and and Ryan, you guys should look. If you got ammonium issues, you got mite issues. Guess what? You probably got a micronutrient issue that's not allowing nitrogen to assimilate in the plant. Therefore, you get an increase in soluble ammonium inside the plant, which is a trigger for mite activity. And so, integration of this testing method may help you guys dial in the mite the mite conundrum you're dealing with. Yep. And one question I do have for you. Um, maybe it's a couple questions, but the first one is, have you seen or noticed, uh, kind of talking about the biological side of things, because obviously biology and its nature can nutrient cycle and acidify things, right? And will that create more, obviously, organic uh, nitrogens and phosphorus, and all these nutrients that will buffer or uh, push more of these chlorides off the, you know, not being uptake by the plant? Um, typically, Kurt, no, they can't. They cannot overpower five to eight million pounds of water. That's the problem. You've got, you've got 1,500 pounds of bicarbonate going to hit your system with three acre feet. That bicarbonate is a direct antagonist to microbial acidification capabilities. Now you can get you can get some important improvement on microbial activity right on the rhizosheath, right in the rhizosphere. Uh -huh. Inevitably, inevitably, unless you're managing the bicarbonate in your irrigation water and reducing its concentration, the bicarbonate will trump biology all day long, every day, and we've seen it for a decade. So, and then also, is there certain micronutrients that you've heard that are better for? these biologies um to to create their enzymes and to you know do their processes is like I've cobalt and molly um what's the other one but have you have you heard of that or seen responses of yeah. using certain micros to enhance this enzyme process that these biologies are doing as temperatures warm up yeah, absolutely. So we we found in in our just trial and research that the MEA chelation, monoethylamine chelation, is probably one of the most favorable, next to a true amino acid chelate, like a glycine chelate or or a heptagluconate type chelation. Um, the ones that are massive antagonists are the EDTA chelates, you know, EDDHA type chelation. Those are the ones. That, that antagonize biology, but the MEA chelation is very, very favorable to microbial activity. So hope I hope you answered that properly there. Jared, when you say that, when you say antagonize biology, can you talk to us a little, a little bit about what your, what the process is that's going on with some of this? Most, most of the antagonism occurs in terms of what it does to plant energy. An EDTA chelated molecule has to come into the plant root. The root has to dissociate the EDTA off of the metal ion that the plant wants. That, can, that takes a massive amount of energy away from what could be exudate production. And so when you look at, look at the energy gradient swings of a plant... EDTA and some of those EDDHA type chelations, they will they will compromise the energy abundance of the plant. And so that, that comes at a direct cost to exudate production. Um, 
And so there, there's quite a bit of data out there coming out of Europe right now on that very concept. I'll see if I can drum up some of that and send share with Courtney so she, she can forward it to you guys. But that's mostly what it does. It's not that the EDTA itself is antagonizing the, the biology. It's just that the association with exudates is compromised. Right. So to get what it to get what it wants, because it's chelated with the other material, that micronutrient is chelated with the other material. The plant has to spend a lot of extra energy to get it is what you're saying. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Interesting stuff for sure. Well, thank you. Are you able, what are you able to do in the water to manage the, the bicarbonates? Uh, you, yeah, what, what do we do with the water to amend bicarbonate? Yeah. Um, that, that comes back to like some of our acid amendments. We'll use acidif acidic amendments to react with the bicarbonate, turn it into CO2 gas and or carbonic acid. That's that's the other strategy, turn, turn that carbonate into carbonic acid in the water so you get that benefit. But it's it's all about acid amendments, Brad, that, that we use to manage the bicarbonate. Yeah. I got a question, Jared. What do you do... Um, what's your best strategy of amending excess lime in a in a soil? Excess lime in a soil to amend it properly, start with the water. The water is the source of the excess lime. Lime is calcium carbonate or bicarbonate in the soil. If you can eliminate the bicarbonate in the water or reduce it, that in time will have favorable effect on the soil bicarbonate load, which constitutes your excess lime. As far as soil amendment, elemental sulfur, um, organic inputs like organic acid inputs like humic, fulvic, those all will help. But usually it, it's a reflection of sulfur, elemental sulfur in the soil, and then amend the water. So you eliminate the bicarbonate in the water as the source. So that's my MO. I'm all about solving the dysfunction. I hate treating symptoms. And so the water is the dysfunction. That's where we got to start. you typically see higher bicarbonates later in the season than you do at the beginning of the season, right? Correct. Yep. Yep. Spring, spring runoff, you got pure clean water, low EC water coming off the mountain that has a pretty favorable effect on the bicarbonate load. But by the time July, June, first part of June, July, when that, that window hits, the bicarbonate load starting to ramp up. I like you think about a reservoir system that those reservoirs are evaporating water into the sky, but the whatever the you know whatever salts are in there, they're not they're not going into the sky. They're just staying in that water and concentrating a little bit. So that makes that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah. And as far as the getting the carbonates out, I mean, I think the the chemistry says that you with with a, a pH that goes lower, you're pulling more. Uh, uh, calcium carbonate into solution, which means that you can push it out with the water, like applying a leaching fraction or something like that. Yep. Um, yeah. That so Sean, sense. we'll, we'll use a hydrogen, we use hydrogen fertilizer products that this, the hydrogen will go antagonize the CO3, the carbonate, turn yeah. it into CO2, gas it off, like say gas it off or secondary reaction with the right organic amendments would be carbonic acid. <laughs> So you can turn it into that pretty favorably. Hey, Jared, this is David. I just question, how do you deal with the buffering component of the soil? You, know, you acidify the water, you, you load the pH there, bring those, you know, carbonates into solution. But then when you hit that, that high pH soil, how do you deal with the buffering effect there? Well, number one, you've got to be able to measure it. And that's what this, what I've presented today, this soil testing method of saturation paste can help you identify what's actually buffering. And so once you can identify what's buffering, now you know how to go forth and, and manage it accordingly. Without, without this soil test, it's a wild ass guess most of the time. And so, like I say, this has just helped us dial in what that buffering effect actually looks like. 
Because that's the thing you take you take and eliminate bicarbonate. There's a lot of nutrient nutrients in our soil tied up as a bicarbonate: calcium bicarb, mag bicarb, potassium bicarbonate, ammonium bicarbonate. You got different sulfur carbonate species in there. You start eliminating the bicarbonate, you're going to have a a flux of new nutrition that comes to comes into solution that the plant can take up. You've got to be able to measure that and quantify what it actually is, and so. Everything affects everything in the soil. And so when you do one thing, you have to be able to measure the reaction of what that one thing was. And so that's that's the system we've created here that helps us dial in and takes out all the all the questions, so to speak. I got another question. Yes, sir. Um, so do certain... Um, minerals affect pH more than others? Meaning like, doesn't sodium have a, a greater effect on raising your pH than calcium and carbon and phosphorus, for instance? Kurt, that's a great question. I, I think yes. I think there are certain minerals that are dominant and key drivers in, in pH. Mm-hmm. But again, pH is a reflection of the amount of soluble hydrogen in the soil solution. And so anything that displaces that hydrogen is what's going to alter the pH, right? And so you're asking some pretty technical chemistry questions. Now you put me on the hot seat. So, well, you know, it's, I'm just shooting in the dark right now. And I figured you're the best uh, target yeah. to shoot at right now. So I yeah, appreciate that. I'll take it for the team. I'll, yeah. Uh, Anyway, yeah, I, I just think, I think like this particular farm, sodium, sodium by and large was the dominant pH driver. Uh -huh. I've got some data I can show later if you guys want to do this again, where we eliminate a lot of that sodium based on some amendments we applied and we had a, we had a decent pH reduction. That's what I've heard. And so I guess what, I guess um, when you maybe have already answered this then. Is uh, sodium is isn't doing the same thing as uh, chloride or an uh, excess lime or is doing it? It's sodium itself. You would say is stands alone of being that main driver. Yeah, probably. I mean, the the, the worst molecule in the world is sodium chloride. Uh, the table salt. My wife loves it on all her food. I can't stand it, but. Uh, when you precipitate chloride and sodium, that sodium chloride, that's, that's bad news for the plant. Sodium yeah. chloride has a, has a real chance to disrupt your total osmotic potential, of the plant water uptake, all your water relationships in the soil are compromised because of sodium chloride. And so if you can manage sodium by and large is the easiest to manage between sodium and chloride. If you can take out sodium, then chloride's not too bad. You can leach it out of the profile pretty easy. And so I focus on managing the sodium. So can calcium push sodium off? And uh, can calcium bind to those, those whatever sodium's bound to and, and allow sodium to be leached? Yes, yeah, so calcium, calcium actually, but soluble, increasing soluble calcium in the soil solution will bump sodium off the CEC site. Calcium will not bind sodium. It, they're, they're positive charges. They can't bind each other. Yeah. But it will push but, sodium and allow sodium to bind elsewhere or not be bound. Yeah. Each. So if you can, if you can kick it, if you can kick sodium off the CEC site and have an associated sulfate ion or a fulvic acid ion sitting there, the sulfate or the fulvic will then bind the sodium. In fact, sodium sulfate insoluble molecule leach it out of the profile. That's, that's the best target. That's why in your soils, Kurt, high loads of sulfur, it's probably going to be your best friend for managing your sodium load. Mm -hmm. And so think about this, sodium and chloride together, as they dehydrate and screw up the osmotic potential of the plant, think of what they can do to the microbial body. They can dehydrate a microbe just as easy as they can a plant. Yeah. So why not carbon, though? Like, why wouldn't carbon do a better job than sulfur? Because isn't carbon a four versus sulfur's a, a two, is it? Or what is it? Uh, you're talking positive charge, just carbon yeah. in general? Yeah, carbon in general. Like, why wouldn't like a, a yeah a humic fulvic 
foliar or a, a soft rock like Leonard diet that we've tried, mm -hmm. could that carbon do just as good or better to, yeah. to tie or to, I guess, bind more yeah. sodium than sulfur could or explain that? What, well, so here's the thing. So, so the carbon, the fulvic fraction particularly is a great binder but it's not a great solubilizer. It, it doesn't have the horsepower to kick sodium off the CEC site. Travis explained earlier about the chemical process of the soil. You've got to have, you got to fight chemistry with chemistry to get it soluble. So you use calcium to bump sodium into solution. You can bind it with sulfate and you can also bind it with fulvic, but outside of getting it off the CEC site, you can't bind it. And that's where that's where the carbon inputs kind of struggle a little bit. It's so, being able to initially buy, break it off and then being yeah. able. Yeah, yeah. But if you when if you, you say sulfur, uh, so go ahead. If you couple the 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 chemistry with the carbon, now you're starting to approach the three pillars that Travis highlighted. If you, carbon chemistry, biological chemistry, you know, now you can really make a big splash quickly. Okay. So, so that that um, amendment with gypsum is kind of a key thing to mention here, I think, because the calcium sulfate is gypsum and it's highly soluble. And then the calcium, which frees up those calcium ions to kick the sodium off of the soil matrix. And I think so that is why it's the gypsum is typically recommended as an amendment for sodium problems. And the reason why it creates better infiltration properties um, is because sodium um, is uh, pretty good at displacing um, or just dis dispersing clay particles and creating uh, so dispersion and pore plugging, um, which is problematic if you're trying to get water to a plant root. And um, so uh, the gypsum amendment um, for promoting infiltration so that you can get the you can get the sodium out of the system and so that it's not dispersing clay particles and, and plugging pores for you. That's I think that the uh, typical uh, amendment for uh, sodium affected soils. So Sean, I, let me I'm gonna plug a product real quick that you guys ought to look at. It's a product called Sulfur Plus. It's, it's a gypsum lookalike on analysis, but it's 20% calcium, 17% sulfate sulfur, and 8% fulvic acid. But it, it's derived from fly ash. And so it runs, it runs at about an 85% solubility versus gypsum running about a 20% solubility. And so you can run 150 to 200 pounds of sulfur plus and do the same job as a ton of gypsum per acre. So, so when I, you say fly ash, are you saying byproduct of coal combustion? Yep, coal, absolutely. So that comes with some heavy metals. Uh, yeah, it's the pro the product is is chemically uh, chemically refined. The, a lot of the heavy metals are pulled out before okay. the product is processed. So it's it's super clean, very favorable agricultural product. Well, that's interesting stuff. Yeah, it's a cool. It's been a phenomenal tool for us. I'm sorry about the camera. I keep getting the message that I've got an unstable connection, so I've killed my, I've killed my camera here. Yeah, no worries there. So, well, I think my five minutes is up, guys. Yeah, what an amazing discussion. This is really great, and I want to say, if you want more access to Jared and his brain, we should come and talk to Jared and Blake on Thursday. And they're going to talk about this and more and hear everything about Blake's operation. Are there any last questions or comments before we shut the meeting down? Oh, Courtney, do they still have time to RSVP for the um, impromptu field day? Yes, they're still, um, yeah, so we're calling the one on Thursday and impromptu field day and you all, I'm assuming since you're on this call that you are on my email list and so um, you should have gotten the flyer about the field day on Thursday, but I'm going to send it again here after I get off this call um, and yeah, you can all RSVP and come, we can talk about this on Thursday and also on. 
so yeah, I think with that, I want to thank all of our presenters. Um, this was, yeah, an awesome conversation. Uh, this is one of the longer five for fives we've had. So this was really great. I hope a lot of people got um, a lot out of this. And I think they did. So uh, yeah, I think we can shut her down. I really appreciate everybody coming and take, yeah, this will be on our YouTube page here in a while. Oh, wait, I meant to put that in the chat real quick for everybody. That's our YouTube page, which will be up about a week or what a week or so. And hopefully we'll see a lot of you on Thursday. This has been awesome, Courtney. Thank you so much. And thanks to the presenters. Uh, you guys are fantastic. Um, super cool discussion. Super interesting. Thanks again. Thank you. All right. We'll see you all soon. Thanks.